Welcome. In this lecture, we will talk about uniform circular motion, centripetal acceleration and force, rotational inertia, torque, centrifugal force, angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum, and the center of mass. There are quite a few things to go over in today's lecture. First, we begin with curvilinear motion. Curvilinear motion is motion that occurs when an object travels along a curved path. To discuss curvilinear motion, we will first introduce what is not curvilinear motion. And this is known as rectilinear motion, also known as linear motion. Say that we have a ball. Linear motion is just as it sounds. It's motion in a line. On the other hand, curvilinear motion has, as you guessed it, curves in the path. If we imagine that we can place or superpose circles at various points along this curved path, such as here, here, and here, we can look at the tangential and radial acceleration of the ball at the particular point along the curved path with the superposed circle as a sort of guide. So for example, at the first point, we have a tangential and radial component of the acceleration relative to this circle where the tangential component of the acceleration is exactly as it sounds, it's tangent to the circle. And the radial component is also as it sounds, it's along the radius of the circle. In this case, it's pointed toward the center of the circle. The total acceleration is the sum of the components and the components are the tangential and the radial accelerations. So we do our parallelogram and we yield our resultant acceleration, which is our total acceleration. And we can do the same thing on the other circle. We have our total acceleration, which is the sum of the tangential and the radial acceleration. And the same for the third circle. Curvilinear motion is just general motion along a curve, but we are going to look particularly at motion in a circle. But before we do that, again, as a reminder, the pink acceleration, which is the resultant, is simply the sum of the two individual components, the radial component and the tangential component of the acceleration. And we can do the same thing for the velocities, and we will be using both the acceleration and the velocities during our discussion in today's lecture. As I mentioned, we want to talk about circular motion, which is a special case of curvilinear motion. And even more special is the specific case of uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion. This is circular motion in which the tangential acceleration is exactly zero. This leaves us only with radial acceleration. And of course, we still have tangential velocity, even though we don't have tangential acceleration. And these two are at a perpendicular angle. And it's these two working together that allows this ball to travel in a perfectly circular path and also uniform in that path. Now, what does uniform mean? Well, it means that the tangential speed is constant. And we will call that speed, as opposed to v sub t, we will simply call it v. And we will know from this point on that in the context of uniform circular motion, when we see this script v, that symbol is in reference to the tangential speed. Now the speed is constant in uniform circular motion. That's what the uniform means. That does not mean that the tangential velocity is constant because it is not. Though the tangential speed is constant, the velocity is not constant. And the reason for that is because the direction is changing along the path. The length of the arrow is not changing, but the direction the arrow is pointed is changing. So that means that our speed is constant, but our velocity is not constant. Now let's take a moment to derive a special relationship between centripetal acceleration or this radial acceleration that we introduced in the previous slides and tangential velocity. And throughout this derivation, it's okay if you're not able to follow along in the derivation. All that you need to understand for the purposes of this course is the end result. But for those of you who are more interested in how we arrive at certain results, this derivation is for you. So consider again our circle. 
And let's consider that our circle has a radius of r. And in this case, I'm saying that the ball begins at some position relative to the center of the circle at r i. And it's moving with some tangential velocity of v sub i. So I'm saying these are the initial conditions here. The ball is at some position r i moving with some velocity v i. And a moment later, along this path, the ball is now at some new position r f. And it's moving with a new velocity v f. And it has traveled some delta r and some delta theta is the angle that has been swept out. Now we know that since this is a circular path, the magnitude of ri and rf are identically r, which is just the radius of the circle. Likewise, since we know that we're speaking about uniform circular motion, vi and vf have the same magnitude of simply v. The tangential speed is the same at every point along a circular path, so long as we are discussing uniform circular motion. Let's move some things around and look at the fact that these are similar triangles, or at least they are about to be, and I'll show you how. The angles between the velocities is the same as the angles between the r vectors. And we can likewise draw a delta v vector just as we drew a delta r vector. And so we have two similar triangles. Now two triangles are called similar if the angle between any two sides is the same for both triangles and if the ratio of the lengths of these sides is the same. And that's exactly what we have here. And so that allows us to write the following equation which is just the equation of two ratios. The magnitude of the change in the velocity over the speed is equal to the magnitude of the change in the position over the radius. And so we can rearrange this so we get the delta v, the magnitude of delta v, is equal to the speed multiplied by the ratio of the magnitude of delta r divided by r. And this is our equation one, at least that is what I will call it. Equation two, which is what we also need to derive the result we're aiming to derive, is just the definition of the acceleration. Here we have the magnitude of the average acceleration is equal to the magnitude of the change in the velocity over the change in time. Now with equation two, we want to plug equation one directly into equation two, like so. And we do a fancy limit and let a delta t go to zero, and we get the result shown on the right. And it's okay if you don't understand limits. I'm not spending a lot of time on this because that is not the purpose of this lecture. I simply want to show you that there is a way to get the relationship of what I have here, where the centripetal acceleration, which we had written before as the radial acceleration, and there's some nuance regarding possible differences between these, but I'm going to say that they are the same for the purpose of our discussion. So we have the centripetal acceleration, and I'll tell you what centripetal means in a moment. That is equal to the tangential speed squared divided by the radius of the circular path. And this is a very important and useful result that is only applicable to uniform circular motion. Now, as promised, centripetal. What is centripetal? What does that word mean? It's an adjective that simply means center seeking or toward the center. It can be used to describe acceleration, force, etc., anything needing the description. And we will apply it today to both acceleration and force. Centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is the acceleration toward the center of curvature. For uniform circular motion, which is what we're dealing with, the mathematical description is exactly what we derived in the previous slides. A sub C, where the subscript here, C, is simply indicating that we are discussing specifically centripetal acceleration. That acceleration, the centripetal acceleration, is equal to the tangential speed squared divided by R. And again, I emphasize that this is only valid for uniform circular motion. Let's give some examples of centripetal acceleration. Here we have a plane going in a circular path. And let's say it's moving in a uniform circular motion, so it has a constant speed, but it's accelerating toward the center. And that acceleration allows it to maintain its path even though it has a constant speed. So the constant acceleration toward the center is what keeps the plane moving in a circular path. Similarly, if we consider the Earth and the Moon, 
The moon has a centripetal acceleration, assuming a uniform path, a uniformly circular path, which it's not perfectly circular, but let's assume that it is for the sake of this discussion. The centripetal acceleration is allowing it to maintain its circular path, and it has a velocity tangent to the path. And again, another example of a perfectly circular path where we assume the can being swung over the girl's head is moving in uniform circular motion. The centripetal acceleration is, as always, toward the center, and the tangential velocity is, well, tangent to that path. But what causes, in all these scenarios, these objects to have center-oriented acceleration? Well, centripetal force does. Centripetal force is the force directed toward the center of a curved path that produces the centripetal acceleration. Nothing new here. Force produces acceleration. So examples of centripetal force, same examples we used before. But it's the force toward the center that is causing the acceleration toward the center. And the particular force in this plane example is lift. Similarly, in our example with the Earth and the Moon, we have the gravitational pull, which is our centripetal force, which is causing our centripetal acceleration. And with the girl in the can, we have tension being the force that is toward the center, and so tension is the centripetal force in this case. So as you can see, centripetal forces are a category of forces. Any force acting toward the center of curvature can be characterized as a centripetal force. Mathematically, we write out Newton's second law, where we say that on the left-hand side, this is the net centripetal force, which is the sum of all centripetal forces. This is the mass, just as always, and this is the centripetal acceleration. So it's just F equals MA, just as we've had before, but now we are discussing a very specific case of uniform circular motion, and so the F, the net force, is the net centripetal force, and the A is the centripetal acceleration caused by the net centripetal force. Now we move on to discuss a new quantity. So let's take a look at two circular paths of different radii. Here's the first one, and here's the second. They're concentric to each other, but that doesn't particularly matter here. The larger one has some radius, I will say R1, and the smaller one has some radius R2. And as you can tell, R1 is greater than R2. So let's say that both objects traverse their respective circular path in the same amount of time, as shown in the animation. So they take the same amount of time to travel their respective circles. So what we would say is that their period, which is denoted by the symbol capital T, is the same, where the period is simply the time interval required for an object to make one complete revolution. So again, both of these balls moved along their circular path in the same amount of time, but their path lengths are indeed different. So let's talk about rotational speed. As I mentioned, the distance traveled is not the same, even though the time it took to travel is the same. So the distance traveled along a circular path is the circumference, which I'm denoting here by d1 for the circumference of the larger circle, and d2 for the circumference of the smaller circle. And the formula for the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. And since we know that the radius of the outer circle, R1, is larger than the radius of the inner circle, R2, we know that the circumference of the outer circle, which I've denoted as D1, is of course larger than the circumference of the inner circle, D2. And the tangential speed then is not the same. The distances covered are not the same, even though the period or the time it takes to travel those distances is the same. So the speed is, as we know, the distance divided by the time. So V1 equals D1 over T, which is equal to the circumference, which is 2 pi R1 over T. Likewise, V2 is D2 over T, which is 2 pi R2 over T. By our previous expressions, we know that since R1 is larger than R2, we can conclude that V1 is greater than V2, or the speed of the ball in the larger circle is faster or larger than the speed of the ball in the smaller circle. So again, the period is the same, but the speeds are not. But let's use the fact that the period is the same to rewrite the equations we had as an equality between ratios. And let's adjust those ratios a little bit or manipulate them. And 
Looking at these, we see that the ratio of the radii over the speeds must be the same in order for this equality to hold. Now, this ratio, or the inverse of it, is what we are going to call the rotational speed, which is denoted by the lowercase Greek omega. So our omega equals v over r. So our rotational speed equals the tangential speed divided by the radius of our circle. But let's look a little bit more closely. What exactly is this rotational speed? And it's also known as angular speed. So what is it? Let's look at a single circle now with a radius r, and we see that if this ball is moving along the path, a couple moments later, it will be at a new position. And it has swept out an angle that I will call delta theta. It has traveled some angle, and it has covered some distance, which I'm calling delta d, which is known as the arc length. Now you can look up the equation for the arc length online, but it's simply the arc length equals the radius times the angle. If I divide both sides by delta t, what do we have? We see on the left-hand side, we have the rate at which position changes. And on the right-hand side, we have the radius multiplied by the rate at which the angular position changes. Now we can rewrite this equation. We know on the left-hand side what the rate at which position changes is. That's just the speed. And on the right-hand side, well, the rate at which the angle changes, that's a different kind of speed, isn't it? Well, that's simply the rotational speed. So we see that now we have an equation that relates the tangential speed, or the linear speed we can call it, to the rotational speed. Now, rotational speed, as we just saw, is the rate of change of the angular position. Now, this equation is important, but I want to emphasize the definition of rotational speed. Again, it's the rate of change of the angular position, or the angle, of an object. So using the equation we derived on the previous slide, we can define the rotational speed as both the change in the angle over the change in time. So that's the rate of change of the angle. And we can also set that equal to the tangential speed over the radius. Now, what does that tell us? Well, if I have a turntable, for example, the objects on the edges and the objects anywhere else will have the same rotational speed, but they do not have the same tangential speed, which is what we saw earlier. Likewise on this, the further you are from the center or the axis of rotation, the faster you are going, even though it all points on a solid rigid body, you have the same rotational speed. So though you might have the same rotational speed, you will not necessarily have the same tangential or linear speed. These are different quantities, though they are relatable as shown in the equation on the slide. The next quantity we'll discuss is rotational inertia rotational inertia is summarized by the following statement. An object rotating about an axis will remain in uniform rotation about the same axis unless acted upon by an external influence. This is very much like the standard inertia, but now it's applied simply to rotation. And this external influence, rather than just being a force, it's going to be torque. And we will talk about torque in a few slides. First, we must flesh out the idea of rotational inertia. Take this dumbbell, for example. If the plates are located near the axis of rotation, which is your arm, so imagine you're holding this dumbbell and you're just twisting it, back and forth, just twisting it. The plates, when they're near your hand, the dumbbell's easy to twist. But if the plates are far away, like at the ends of the bar, which makes us look less like a dumbbell now, and more like a weird barbell, this is difficult to rotate. When the mass is further away from the axis of rotation, this is more difficult to rotate. So rotational inertia, which is often written as a script I symbolically, depends on one, the total mass of the object and the distribution of that mass about the axis of rotation. So the greater the rotational inertia of an object, the harder it is to change the object's rotational state. Hence, a tightrope walker, in order to increase his rotational inertia, will grab onto a long pole and hold it, because now mass is distributed far from the point at which he would rotate. And we do this intuitively, or I should say we know this intuitively, because whenever we try to balance ourselves on something, we stick our arms out. We distribute our mass as much as is possible far from our axis of rotation. 
and we would be rotating about our feet because we'd fall to the left or to the right about the axis of our feet. So we stick our arms out to the sides increases our rotational inertia, making it more difficult for us to fall over. Let's look at an example of a pencil. Now a pencil is very easy to rotate, but let's compare these three, which we only see one now, but there will be three examples, and the difficulty depending on how we rotate these pencils. This scenario here is easy to rotate because the mass is distributed very close to the axis of rotation. But if I instead twist it around this new dotted line axis, the mass of the pencil is distributed further away from the axis of rotation, making it more difficult to rotate. And again, now the entirety of the pencil's mass is distributed far from the axis of rotation. And so, this is the hardest scenario in which to rotate the pencil. So again, rotational inertia depends on how massive an object is, but also where that mass is distributed relative to the axis of rotation. Some examples are here. Memorizing these is not necessary. I'm simply putting these here to indicate that though all these objects have the same mass, so assume that m is equal across all of them, the rotational inertia is not the same. So just because something has the same mass doesn't mean its rotational inertia will be the same. If the two shapes have identical mass and start from rest at the top of the incline, the solid disk will reach the bottom first. And why is that? Well, if they both have the same mass, then we don't need to consider mass anymore. We need to consider how that mass is distributed. In the hoop or that ring, all the mass is distributed far from the center. It will have a higher rotational inertia than the solid object, the solid disk. And a higher rotational inertia means gravity will have a harder time accelerating the object. And therefore, the object with the higher rotational inertia will not accelerate as rapidly and will therefore not reach the bottom as rapidly. Torque is simply the tendency of a force to cause rotation. Written in its more general form, torque is a vector and is equal to the cross product of two other vectors. Now we, of course, are not going to discuss the cross product in detail in this course. It's far beyond the scope of this course. We will discuss the concepts and we will discuss how to calculate the value of the torque. Conceptually, what is torque? Well, it's the tendency of the force to cause rotation. So imagine that you are grabbing onto this door handle. You're grabbing onto the outside of the handle. You're applying a force at the handle's edges or the, the knob, I suppose, the edges of the knob. And the way that you apply that force causes the knob to rotate. And so you've applied a torque. Likewise, if we look at this faucet, which appears to be from the 50s or something, we apply a force to the handle, which causes the handle to rotate. Hence, we've applied a torque. We've applied some force at some non-zero distance from the axis about which this handle would rotate, which produces a torque. And again, if we have a wrench trying to either loosen or tighten a nut, we apply a force at some distance away from the axis about which the nut will rotate, and we will then produce a torque. So let's look at this wrench example. And let's say that the axis of rotation is at the center of the nut, which I will identify with a black dot. And let's say I grab onto this wrench some distance r away, and I apply a force f. And the distance and the force together produce a torque that will be counterclockwise in direction. Now, something to notice is that in this particular case, and generally, the force is not parallel or anti-parallel to the distance or the distance from the axis of rotation. It's at some angle relative to that distance vector. And so we're going to look at the components of the force that are along the distance, or the component, I should say, singular, as well as the component that is perpendicular. So the component of the force that is perfectly aligned with this distance vector is f cosine theta. And don't be alarmed by the appearance of cosine again. We saw it in a previous chapter, but we're going to look at f sine theta. And still, don't be alarmed by the cosine and the sine theta functions, I will do my best to explain them. Now, I know I already explained cosine theta, so I will not take time to explain that one. I will explain sine theta, and specifically in the context of torque, in a few moments. 
Now torque, if we just want the value rather than the full vector quantity of torque, because torque is a vector, if we just want the value, it's simply the distance times the force times sine of the angle between them. And this is valid along this two-dimensional plane. Now I can rearrange my torque equation, so I have r sine theta times f. That doesn't do anything with regard to the value. The value output will still be the same. But there's a reason I'm doing it, because in the textbook, the diagram shown here, or the illustration, is presented slightly differently, where we extend the force down, and then we draw a line parallel, or excuse me, perpendicular to that extended line, to the axis of rotation. So these two new dotted white lines are perpendicular to each other. And the textbook, as well as many other books, refer to this dotted line on the left, this r sine theta, as the lever arm. This is not my preference. I don't see the benefit in it, but still, it is what is presented in the textbook. But of course, sine theta is not presented in the textbook, but I want to put sine theta there because it does allow us to see a little bit more of the significance of how the angle between the distance and the force contribute to the value of the torque. So we need to look at sine theta. What is it? It's this curvy function, this wave function, and you should recognize this from a previous chapter where we discussed cosine. Cosine's a little bit different. It's shifted, but it's the same shape, just shifted along the theta axis. So let's look at sine theta at specific values, values that are important for this course. So let's look at sine of zero. So what is sine equal when theta is zero? So when the angle between the distance and the force is zero, what is the output of sine of zero? It's simply zero. And this is for the scenario, again, where the distance r and the force are along the same line. They are parallel to each other. What about sine of 90? Well, that's a value of one. And that's a scenario when the force is completely perpendicular to the distance. And so this is actually in the context of torque this is the point at which maximum torque is created when the force is at a 90 degree angle to the distance vector from the axis of rotation. What about sine of 180? Well, that's also zero, and that's for the case when the force is anti-parallel to the distance. What about sine of 270? That's negative one. And that's the case when the force is again perpendicular to the distance. If we take the magnitude of this, this is again a maximum value of torque. So when sine is either 90 or 270, in other words, when the force is completely perpendicular to the distance vector, that is when you will have a maximum torque. Sine of 360, same as sine of zero, you get zero. So what does this mean? This means that torque depends on one, the magnitude of the force, and the angle the force makes with the position vector. And I forgot, it also depends on the position at which the force acts relative to the pivot point. So let's put some illustrations on the screen. Obviously, to increase the torque, you one can increase the force you apply. But if you are a human and you have a limited capacity for exerting force, then you want to use other means to increase the torque. You can also set the angle to 90 degrees. Now, what I mean by 90 degrees is when the distance vector, which extends from the axis of rotation directly to the point at which the force is applied, which is better shown on my diagram than these pictures taken from the book, when that is 90 degrees, or in other words, when the lever arm is perfectly aligned with the distance vector, that is when your torque is maximized. And you can also simply increase the distance at which you apply the force. Let's do an example. What is the weight of the block at the 10 centimeter mark? So there's two blocks. The block on the left is at the 10 centimeter mark. That's what we want to find. We want to find the weight of that block. So what are the givens that we have? Well, F1, that's the weight. We don't know what that is. We need to find that. R1 is simply the distance from the axis of a rotation, which is 40 centimeters by just looking at the ruler. F2, as stated in the picture, is 20 newtons. And R2, by looking at the picture, we can determine to be 30 centimeters. So we must create a rotational analog of a Newton's second law. So Newton's second law, in the form that we're familiar with, is simply F net equals MA. Well, what is a rotational analog of that? It's the net torque. 
the net torque, which is the sum of all the torques, is equal to the rotational inertia multiplied by this alpha. This alpha is simply rotational acceleration, which we haven't bothered defining because in every example you get in this particular course, the rotational acceleration will be zero. But anyway, let's look at the similarities between these two equations. Here we have the force term, here we have the inertial term, and here we have the motion term. Now these are both Newton's second law. We have just written this second one in a more convenient form than the first one would be for this particular situation since we are dealing with rotation. So let's write this again. Now we need to establish a convention for rotation, which means we need to say which direction of rotation is positive. Well, I'm going to say counterclockwise is positive. And as I mentioned before, the rotational acceleration is zero. We are in a state of equilibrium. So let's write out the torques. The torque is just the distance multiplied by the force. We have a 90 degree angle between all the distance vectors and the force vectors. So sine of 90 degrees is exactly one and so we will not see sine of theta show up here because every time sine of theta would otherwise show up, it is equal to one. Let's write out the torques. The first one is simply R1, F1. And we know that this is positive because this force, if there were no other forces applied to the ruler, this force applied at a distance of R1 would cause this ruler to rotate counterclockwise. And we have set up our convention such that a counterclockwise rotation is positive. Conversely, the other force applied at some distance R2 would produce a clockwise torque, which is negative based on our convention. And so we have R1F1 minus R2F2. Let's add R2F2 to both sides, giving us this. We'll divide by R1 and we'll solve for F1. We'll remind ourselves of the givens and we'll plug in our values and we see that the answer is 15 newtons. The weight of the block at the 10 centimeter mark is 15 newtons. Motion in accelerated frames. So consider an accelerating rail car. Inside the car, a ball is hanging from a string. The rail car, again, is accelerating, which I've denoted by an arrow to the right, and the symbol A denoting acceleration. Now, an inertial observer at rest outside the car claims the acceleration of the ball is provided by the horizontal component of the tension. So the ball is being pulled downward by the gravitational force, but it's also being pulled upward by the tension force. And again, the observer looking from the outside in, standing at rest, relative to the earth, let's say, is looking at this ball inside this accelerating rail car and saying, oh, the ball inside the rail car is being accelerated with the car because of the tension, the horizontal component of the tension. What about a non-inertial observer? So what if someone's inside the rail car that is accelerating? Well, a no this non-inertial observer, which, who's riding in the car, will say that the net force on the sphere, this ball, is zero. And the deflection of the cord from the vertical is due to a fictitious force that balances the horizontal component of the tension. Now, this may seem a bit strange and a bit abstract and far out there, but let's give a more perhaps relatable example a car that's turning. So let's say that your friend is driving a car and that friend of yours turns left. Well, let's say that the passenger, which perhaps is you, perhaps is not you, whatever, the passenger will feel some things as the car is turning to the left. From this passenger's frame of reference, a force appears to push her toward the right door. But this force is not really a force because there's nothing actually pushing her. There's just the sensation of being pushed to the right. You all know what this is like. You turn left, you feel like you're pushed into the door on the right. You turn right, you feel like you're being pushed to the door on the left. But there's nothing actually pushing you. This sensation of being pushed one way or the other as you are in an accelerating frame is known as a fictitious force or it's actually Inertia is what's causing this. Now in the frame, in this car, you feel it as a force, but it's not really a force. It is simply inertia wanting you to continue going in the path you were going, but because you're in a car or something else that's accelerating, and remember, turning is a form of acceleration, you're not allowed to go in the direction you were going. Because of that, you feel like you're being forced. But the real force is the friction that's holding you there. So relative to the reference frame of Earth, the car seat is what's actually applying a real force toward the left on the passenger, causing her to change direction with the rest of the car. She's moving with the car, 
Even though she feels like she's being pushed to the right, she's still moving left with the car. And what's causing her to actually move left with the car is the real force of friction. Let's take another example. This is an example where you can have artificial gravity of sorts. You're in this rotating frame, and you can create a space station like this, a rotating space station. And because of the rotation, you're rotating fast enough, you can simulate gravity, where you will have the real force, which is just the, the normal force, the support force of the ground, but you'll experience this fictitious force, which is the centrifugal force, which is really just inertia. So inertia can allow you to experience something that feels like a force, but is really not. And this leads us to the centrifugal force. Since we're talking about circular or rotational motion, the centrifugal force is simply a force, the apparent force, felt in a rotating frame which is in direct opposition to the centripetal force. These are different things. So the centrifugal force feels very, very real if you are in the rotating frame. But again, nothing is actually pushing on you. So it's not a real force, even though it feels very real. The only thing that's causing this quote unquote force is inertia but it has very real effects. For example, if you were to weigh yourself on one of the poles versus on the equator, there will be a difference in what the scale measures. And the reason for that is the centrifugal force, which again is just inertia, pushes you axially outward, which conflicts with the radially inward force of gravity. So because you're being rotated around, you're being pushed outward from the, some away from the axis. You can experience this in carnival rides. When you go, I don't know what they're called, but you go around on some spinning ride and you're shoved to the outside and you're stuck there. You just lay down and it pushes you into that sloped bed. Once the rotation ceases, you can easily get up, but the rotation causes you to experience this centrifugal force, which again is just inertia, but it feels very real and it has real consequences if you are in that rotating reference frame. A scale will read a smaller value on the equator than it will on a pole, simply because the centrifugal force is larger on the equator than it is at the pole. Angular momentum. Angular momentum, a vector quantity describing the inertia of rotation inherent to rotating objects. It is the rotational analog of linear momentum, which we denoted earlier in previous lectures as lowercase p, which is a vector. Let's consider a reference frame and an object at some distance r from the origin of a reference frame moving with some momentum p. Let's begin with Newton's second law. And we're writing it in the calculus form that we introduced in a previous lecture. And again, you don't need to know the calculus. You don't need to know any of the derivation I'm about to put here. You just need to know the end result. But the trick to get angular momentum from Newton's second law is to take the cross product of both sides with this distance. And the left hand side you'll notice is the definition of the vector torque. And so we simply write torque here. And another cool trick is to add zero to both sides. And we actually, doesn't matter if we add zero to the left side, it's just zero. So we just look at the right hand side and you say, well, that's not zero. I didn't add zero. Well, there's nuance here and it's okay if it's not understood, but this cross product is the cross product between the velocity and the momentum. And that just happens to be zero based on a property of the cross products. So again, you don't need to know it. You don't need to know any of this derivation. We see that if you do know calculus, you can see what's going on. If you don't, that's completely fine. We see that the torque is actually the time derivative of R cross P. Well, instead of writing R cross P, why don't we just call it something different. We see that this R cross P plays the same role in rotational motion that P plays in translational motion. So let's just call it something. That is exactly our angular momentum. And we denote it by capital L. Now, why do we denote it by capital L? I don't know, but that is how it's denoted. Now, the value of angular momentum can be found just as with torque. You want the angle between R and P so some theta, and you simply write the magnitude of R times the magnitude of P multiplied by sine of the angle between them. So let's give an example of this. Let's say we have an object moving in a circular path at some distance R away from the center, and it's moving with some momentum P. What is the angular momentum? 
L equals R P sine theta. Well, the angle here is 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees is one, so we're left with just R P, and P is the linear momentum, which is just M V. So the angular momentum in this very specific case is R M V. And this is all done for a point particle. What if we have a rigid body? For a rigid body rotating about a fixed axis, the value of the angular momentum can conveniently be written as L, which is our angular momentum, equals the rotational inertia multiplied by the rotational speed. And I'm not going to bother proving this one. We've had enough proofs in today's lecture, but this is a handy equation that I highly recommend you write down somewhere. Now let's talk about conservation of angular momentum. Just as we had conservation of linear momentum, we also will have conservation of angular momentum. So let's rearrange this, and again, it's in the calculus form, but we are now going to approximate by putting in it in the form that we use in this course. And this is the rotational analog of the momentum impulse relation. So we've come across the momentum impulse relation in chapter six. This is the rotational version of that. Now, if we want to see this quantity of angular momentum conserved, it requires specific conditions. And we see that by thinking, okay, if the external net torque is zero, what happens? Well, if the torque is zero, then the right-hand side becomes zero, and we see that the rotational momentum is conserved. And we can rewrite this noting that delta L is simply the final angular momentum minus the initial angular momentum. And we rearrange, and we see here that the initial angular momentum equals the final angular momentum. And so conservation of angular momentum if the net external torque applied to a system is zero, the angular momentum of that system is conserved. That is, the initial and final values are the same. Now, what are the implications of this? Say we have someone rotating with two dumbbells being held and they're held out. So they're rotating, they have some rotational inertia, I sub I, they have some initial rotational speed, omega sub I, and then they're rotating, they're rotating, rotating, and they bring the dumbbells in. Well, when they bring the dumbbells closer to them, they reduce their rotational inertia because the mass that was once distributed far from the axis of rotation is now distributed near to the axis of rotation. So that reduces the rotational inertia. So our final rotational inertia is less than our initial rotational inertia. Conversely, our final rotational speed is greater than our initial rotational speed. And this is due to the relation we just found, where the initial angular momentum is equal to the final angular momentum. So the product of the rotational inertia and the rotational speed must be maintained if there is no external net torque applied to our system. This is what you see with ice skaters who do all their spins. When they want to go very quickly, they tuck in everything. They bring their arms in close. When they want to slow down, they shoot their arms out. Ignoring air resistance, the angular momentum of this boy is conserved during his jump and spin action. To spin faster, he tucks his arms and legs into a ball, reducing his rotational inertia while increasing his rotational speed. To slow his spin, he extends his arms and legs, which increases his rotational inertia while reducing rotational speed. Center of mass. Center of mass is the average position of all the mass composing a system. The position of every piece of the system is mathematically weighted by the mass of that piece. Now we won't go into the math of determining the center of mass, but it's important to note that objects that have more mass will contribute more dramatically to the total center of mass of an entire system. So a more massive piece counts more toward the center of mass result. Why do we care? Well, we care because the translational motion of the center of mass of whatever system we're looking at is the same as if all the mass of the system were concentrated at that point. Now let that sink in for a moment, but let's give an example in case there's some difficulty wrapping your mind around it. Let's say we have a very simple system, an asymmetric dumbbell of sorts. We have a large mass on the bottom and a small mass on the top connected by a rigid bar. The center of mass is here. Now what happens if we apply a force above the center of mass? So let's say we kick it or something. There's no air resistance, no friction, whatever. We're just looking at this thing in a vacuum and we just apply a force at this point. What's going to happen? Well, the object rotates clockwise about the center of mass, but the center of mass translates as if the force were applied directly to it. it just goes in a perfectly straight line. Even though the system itself is rotating, it's rotating about the center of mass and the center of mass is going straight. Let's reset and apply a force below the center of mass. Now what's going to happen? 
Well, the object rotates in the opposite direction, but the center of mass still moves in a straight line exactly as if the force were applied directly to the center of mass. Let's reset again. What happens if we apply a force directly at the center of mass? You can probably guess there won't be any rotation and the object will simply move all in a straight line. But in all three scenarios, whether the object's rotating or not rotating, the center of mass behaves as if the force were applied directly to that point. Let's look at an example of someone throwing a baseball. The baseball moves following a standard parabolic trajectory where the center of mass is pointed out with this orange dot. And it's easy to see how a baseball moves, but what if instead someone swings and accidentally lets go of the bat? Well, the center of mass, again denoted by this orange dot, will follow the same type of trajectory that the baseball followed, but the bat will be rotating about the center of mass as the center of mass follows the parabolic trajectory. Something like this. Let's say that we balance a ruler on a finger. Gravitational force is being applied all along this ruler, but the weight of this stick behaves as if all of the gravitational force were concentrated at the stick's center. Assuming the stick itself is uniform density, we can act as if all the force is applied at the center of mass. And of course, there's the upward support force applied by our finger that holds this guy here, but that's not really what's important. So let's use this concept of the center of mass to solve another problem. The rock and meter stick balance at the 25 centimeter mark, as shown in the sketch. The meter stick has a mass of one kilogram. What must be the mass of the rock? Let's move this. Now we should draw forces on the stick. Well, our stick is our system, so we're going to draw all the forces on the stick as applied by external influences. So this is the mass multiplied by g. This is the force of gravity of the rock as applied to the stick. And then we have the support force of the fulcrum as applied to the stick. Now, are there any other forces? Well, of course, this stick weighs something. So doesn't it have its own weight being applied to it? Sure, but where do we apply it? Well, based on what we just discussed, we can apply it directly at the center of the stick. So we have the mass of the stick multiplied by g, which is simply our weight. Let's draw our distance vectors now. We're gonna do torque again, we're gonna to apply torque. So here's our distance to the rock's force and here's our distance to the stick's force on itself, or I guess it's not on itself, it's the force applied by the earth on the stick. Let's look at our equation that we saw before. We know that we are in equilibrium and so our rotational acceleration is zero. Therefore the whole right hand side is zero. We need to establish a convention for which way is positive in this rotation. I'm gonna say again that counterclockwise is positive. So let's write what we have on the left-hand side. So what do we have? Based on our convention, the torque produced by the weight of the rock is going to be positive. So we have the weight of the rock multiplied by the distance. And then we have, well, what's the torque produced by the support force, N? Well, it's at a zero distance. So it's N times zero. So it's just going to be zero. And then we have the torque produced by the stick, the weight on the stick. And this is going to produce a torque in the clockwise direction, so it's negative. So let's simplify our equation. Let's divide both sides by g. Let's subtract the mass of the rock times the distance of the rock from both sides, leaving us with this. Multiply both sides by negative one. And we divide both sides by the distance from the fulcrum to the center of mass of the stick. Rearrange, and we see that the distances are identical. So R sub R divided by R sub S is exactly one. In this particular example, the masses are the same. And that just happens to be because of the way this was set up. This will rarely be the case, but all the steps that were used in this example can be applied generally, even when the mass of the stick is not the same as the mass on the rock. Summary, we discussed uniform circular motion, centripetal acceleration and force, rotational inertia, torque, centrifugal force, angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum, and center of mass. We covered a lot of material today. I'll see you next time.